So I uh, thank you very much for having me here. I, uh, I have to work on my Polish language. I think uh, Janusz said some very valuable stuff. The only word I understood was Mohammed Gavdat. So, okay. Um, uh, um, I, I um, cannot tell you how excited we are to have you with us today. I think it's, uh, it's a good practice that we started uh, when Google um, uh, you know, started to become something on the internet to try and do two things in our Google days. One is to try and uh, tell you a little bit about the world from the angle that we see it, because honestly, it's a very different world when you're inside Google. And the other is, uh, is to try and hear you and understand a little bit about what you uh, have been going through and what you want us to do. So in the future, we try and improve what we can offer. Um, by the nature of my job, I have to travel almost all the time. Uh, in the last three weeks, for example, I spent only three days at home. My, uh, my kids consider this a uh, benefit because they're teenagers. They don't want to have me there. So, um, so basically, um, I get the opportunity to travel and, um, and meet a lot of people from across the world. And I think um, one, one thing that is very common everywhere in the world is what the Internet is doing to the world we live in. So I, I'm going to try to, um, uh, to, to spend time with you today to talk about three sides of the Internet. One is um, how is the Internet, from a consumer point of view, uh, changing our life? Uh, the second is how businesses are reacting to that and how they're making use of the Internet as we know it. And then perhaps take a, a guess, uh, a look into the future and try to understand uh, a little bit about some of the trends going forward. So let's start with um, how uh, the internet is shaping our lives. How many of you have a DSL at home? How many of you connect that to a wireless network, Wi-Fi? Okay. So this is um, uh, not a video against Jeff Bezos. I don't know how many of you know, know Jeff Bezos. He's the CEO of Amazon. Uh, definitely one of my... Uh, um, favorite CEOs on the face of the planet, very visionary. This is a speech that Jeff gave back in 2003. Yeah, we think it's getting better. But have you tried to install 802.11 yourself? <laughs> I challenge you to try. It's very hard. I, I know PhDs in computer science, this process has brought them to tears. Absolute tears. Um, and, that's, and that's assuming you already have DSL in your house. Try to get DSL installed in your house. The, the engineers who do it every day can't do it. How, how many of you have installed your Wi-Fi yourself? Yeah, right? Back in 2003, the CEO of the largest visionary, uh, one of the largest visionary companies on the internet says it's driving PhDs to tears. Right? The, the internet has gone so far, and sometimes we forget that in four or five years uh, we, we, have, we have accomplished so much. So I'll take you quickly through how far the internet has gone. Let's think about um, uh, the internet from four sides. People interact with the internet from four areas. One is uh, information, the other is communication, the third is participation, and the fourth is social. I'll talk to you about each of them separately. So when it comes to information, uh, let's discover the types of the information that's now on the internet. Um, how many of you are familiar with TED? The, yeah, TED, if you're not familiar with TED, I really think you should be. This is a get-together of the you know, brightest thinkers on Earth. They, they, you know, some of the best minds on Earth will get together uh, in a TED conference, normally a few hundred people in a room, and they discuss some very controversial ideas. They come from all walks of life, they come from all backgrounds, politicians, you know, scientists, uh, inventors, and so on. And for a, uh, for a while, TED was just a closed conference, and then recently, in the last few years, they decided to put the content on the web. What that means is that anybody in the world can have access to uh, speeches like the ones that Jeff made here or speeches you know, from Al Gore, the first uh, speech on uh, global warming and so on and so forth, is no longer kept within closed doors. It's available on the web for everybody. TED today is being viewed more than, uh, it has a viewership of more than 50 million. Uh, some of the top videos on TED have been watched more than 2 million times on YouTube alone. Now this type of democracy 
is really opening up the world of information from just being confined to some uh, some people who are the elite, if you want, uh, to some to, to the whole world. This is also available in things like the MIT courseware. So the uh, MIT University puts a lot of its um, education and knowledge out there in the open for everybody. Uh, or the in, you know I don't know if you've uh, recently tried the iTunes U, the iTunes University. What happens there is that I always say my kids in the Middle East you or your kids, if you're old enough uh, in Poland, will have the same access to the information that people in the top league universities in the world have. Which means that what the internet is really doing is it's making the limitation on knowledge uh, uh, only confined by your willingness to acquire that knowledge. Uh, I personally am very interested in game theory, for example, at an older age I decided to go to the web. There is so much content, I can go back to universities just on the web and learn that. It comes to, um, to the scale of information and it starts to shock you. In, uh, in 2008, it is estimated that there has been 487 exabytes of information added to the web. How many of you are familiar what an exabyte is? No hands, one hand, two hands. So I think I, three, I should explain it. Um, let's put it this way. The, the complete works of J Shakespeare is five megabytes. If you fill up a pickup truck of those complete works of Shakespeare, that comes to a um, gigabyte, which is like the USB stick. A billion of those is an exabyte. In 2008, we developed 487 bi a billion of those. So uh, just to put it in perspective, from the dawn of humanity until 2003, human beings developed a knowledge that is worth five exabytes. In 2008 alone, we developed eight times as much every month. Now, all of that is being put on the web. We get uh, more than 3.6 billion questions a day. People come to Google and they ask us questions. To be able to answer those questions, we have to take this wealth of knowledge and put it in a format uh, that is searchable so that we can answer you in that one microsecond or fraction of a microsecond. And to do that, we have to index more than 300 billion pages. And as we do this, we try and go through uh, what we call the wisdom of the crowds. So the one thing that I am very proud about being in Google uh, is, that, is that we, um, even though we are in a position that allows us to sort of, um, like the media uh, um, normally programs what they show on their, on their, on, on, on their show, we are not pre-programming anything. What happens is that the crowd tells you the answer to your question. And as we do this, uh, we use PageRank, for example, as one of the technologies. PageRank, if you think about it, is an equation that has more than 500 million variables. So every vote for a single page on the web counts as a variable. And for us to be able to tell you this is the most likely answer to your question, we have to go through those and answer you in a microsecond. Now, that level of democracy once again, I think is a huge change to the way people live. So people today not only get that amazing wealth of information, but they get it in a way where they decide what is important. Nobody tells them that something is more important than the rest. I think this democracy of information is at the core of what the internet has done to our lives. Let's talk about communication. Um, Definitely one of the killer apps on the internet is how people took that wealth of knowledge and they started to take it uh, to their friends and acquaintances and so on. Now, um, um, it, um, it is said that uh, nobody can count for sure, but they, we, we understand that there is around 33 billion instant messages sent every day. Uh, there is more than 210 billion emails sent every day. Uh, think about that. These are numbers that I don't think we are aware of in our minds. The beauty of, of email is that rather than you and I discussing thump, something agreeing or disagreeing, email basically is a documentation of knowledge. Think of your own email and think about how many times you ended up with an email that had an information that you really liked, but that came from somebody that you don't know at all. Now that cascade of knowledge, uh, perpetual knowledge, is something that email brought to our life that was not there before. Uh, more importantly, there is now hunger for knowledge on the go, all the time. Any Twitters here? 
No? Okay, right. You have to try that. It's quite interesting. So basically, more than 50 million subscribers to Twitter. 46% of them will check for tweets every day. Right? These are, this is a huge sign that the new generation does not only want knowledge, they want knowledge as it's happening. They want it all the time. Very, very interesting uh, story. Let's talk about participation, my favorite, favorite part of the internet. Now, um, I have grown in a, uh, in a part of the world where, um, where knowledge was not um, uh, um, you know, available all the time and the ability to express your views was not uh, granted all the time. Um, you know, uh, to, to, my, to myself, my mother uh, bought us the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was 14 and it was like, whoa, you know, all the knowledge in the world. Right uh, now, Wikipedia is by far the largest encyclopedia on earth. More than 130 million articles on Wikipedia in 250 languages. Now, the thing about Wikipedia is that it's not developed by the expert. Understand that. Knowledge on the web is no longer developed by the expert. It's a, developed by the wisdom of the crowd. More than 500,000 Wikipedians are actively changing and shaping and fine-tuning the, the knowledge because knowledge is alive. Knowledge is a, is a view you know, a combined perspective of multiple uh, people, and it also changes from one place to the other and from one point in time to the next. Wikipedia, as a, as a, a sign of the world that we live in today, is really a massive change. In the last decade, if you think about the impact of the, uh, your, your perspective of the world and how much of that is not coming from the expert, but is coming from uh, other people who may know something about the story. Blogger is a fantastic tool, or blogging in general is a fantastic tool. It's estimated that between 2002 uh, until today, there has been a blog issued every single second. Count that, more than 130 million blogs in that period. There is more than 250 words written on Blogger every minute of every day. Now, this is a tremendous ability for people to share and express their views in a way that is very different than the past. Uh, YouTube, of course, you can imagine, is, um, is really another, uh, another uh, part of that revolution that is uh, really changing our world. So, so it is not, um, 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 you know, not everybody is a writer, not everybody is an author that can write on Blogger, uh, but everybody has a video camera or a phone camera. Uh, people upload to YouTube more than 20 hours of video every minute of every day understand that, compare that to the production capacity of all the networks in the world. This is by far the largest production house on earth, which is the crowd that goes to YouTube. Some of those videos who came from nobody, somebody that was never a star, you know, not Angelina Jolie for sure, and uh, you know, this person has been watched on YouTube alone more than 130 million times, the evolution of dance. Uh, uh, that video was copied to other sites. I think that the combined total is somewhere around 170 million views. There is no, um, I, do, I cannot think of a TV show that has been watched 170 million times. Right now, when you think about that, the distribution of that show across the world, if you think about uh, that map down there, the, the geography is so um, uh, undiscriminating, if you want. Those new concepts and new ideas just spread across the world, whether it's in Japan or Russia or Poland or the US or Australia, people just take those concepts and they accept them. My favorite uh, um, um, uh, example of participation is Kiva. Uh, and Kiva is a micro um, loans site. They lend people, uh, they lend money to poor people. Uh, and it's very impressive. Kiva has made out more than 130 million loan. They have more than 560,000 lend lenders on their database. Now, the beauty of Kiva is that lending or charity is no longer as we used to know it. It's not like you contribute to a cause. You know, I'm going to give money to cancer research. People on Kiva, lenders will know the story of the person that they are lending to. They will know where they are from, what uh, their pain, uh, the pains in their life are. They will know about their family. They know, will know about their dreams. They will know what business they're trying to, uh, to start. And then they will offer the money uh, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, helping them uh, start that business. It's not a charity, it's a loan. And it is a loan that has a, 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 an impressive 98.5% 
payback rate. There is no financial institution on earth that gets back 98.5% uh, of their loans paid back. The reason for that is that level of social commitment uh, or social um, weaving of our, um, of our um, social uh, um, uh, you know, fabric that is very, very different and very new. Um, I think um, social is, is definitely, uh, has, has definitely been the, the uh, biggest, whoops, sorry. Uh, has been definitely the biggest uh, um, um, wave of growth in the last few years. Um, you, uh, Facebook today has more than 300 million subscribers. And this whole concept of, uh, of virtual friends is very real, by the way. How many of you have a friend uh, on the web that you've never met in your life? Aha, uh -huh. quite interesting. In, in, in China, two-thirds of people online uh, accept the fact that they say, I, I have friends and I'm willing to have friends online that I will never meet in, in, in my life. In the UK, 25% of people online are actually. One of the most interesting surveys I've, uh, I've uh, seen recently is they served, surveyed uh, 10,000 married couples in the US and found out that 1,900 of them met online, while only 1,700 met uh, in, at work or through other friends. So it tells you a little bit about how our social life is going. Uh, those communities, by the way, even though the bigger names are very famous, uh, some of the other ones, you, which you may not know because of your age, uh, um, uh, Pop, uh, Pop Tropica, for example, is a community for five to 10 year olds. So uh, kids between the age of five to 10, 76 million of them, believe me, they think of the, uh, of the guy, other guy on Pop Tropica as more as their friend than their you know, the boy on, in, in the apartment next door. Uh, uh, Habu is an, a community for 10 to 15 year olds, 135 million users on Habu. Uh, this is their virtual world in a way. Now, um, I need you to understand something and please don't get me wrong here. Poptropica at 76 million is bigger than the population of Germany. Habu is, is approaching that of Russia. Facebook is closing on very closely on the US, and the whole World Wide Web at 1.8 billion people is by far beating the population of, uh, of China. These, this is the world's largest nation by far, okay? Now, when you think about this, this world's largest nation, I don't know if you've read a book uh, called Tribes. Uh, tribes, uh, the, the, the concept of us being bound by geographical boundaries or nationalities or languages is going away. What's happening really is that people are starting to look at people that are similar to them, regardless of what, where they come from. As long as we, jo we have a joint interest in playing video games or in chatting about a certain topic or, you know, I don't know what, as, as long as you have a, a, a similar interest, then you're my friend, right? And as long as you start to get those tribes together and start to market to them, uh, in a similar way, regardless of where they are, you can have a very successful business. But more importantly, I made a speech a couple of days ago in, uh, in, in TED, uh, which was really all about the fact that this change is truly changing our social fabric. We're truly getting to a point where my, f my kids, uh, uh, you know, if somebody tells them the other guy is the enemy, They'll say, actually, the other guy is quite cool. I, you know, he's my friend. I met him online. I know him very well. I'll, you know, I'll send you a link to his blog. You'll probably understand his point of view. I think there is a significant shift to how people interact with the world because of the internet. Now, so you would agree, raise your hand, that the web has gone a long way since the days where Jeff Bezos said it's hard to install DSL, yeah? We've gone a very long way. And I, I, I really think it's, uh, it's, you know, it's something that we at Google are very proud of. We didn't do that, but we're part of it. And, and it's something that we're really proud to be part of. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the, the business uh, impact of this and how people are starting to take some of those trends and, uh, and basically change the way they do business. But allow me to, um, to go back a bit and talk to you about the way, um, the way business uh, you know, I, I, I tend to believe that, I tend to believe that uh, this is nothing new. So a lot of people think of the internet world as a totally new arena. It's not. You know, uh, I, uh, I heard analogies between the internet uh, bubble in the years 2000 and the gold rush. Uh, I hear lots of analogies between, uh, you know, TV, print, radio, 
and the internet, right? Uh, it's technology that basically comes in to shape our world. Our, as, as, as our S-curve becomes shorter, things happen faster, so we start to notice it more in a generation rather than a few generations. But it's the same curve if you, if you look at print, if you look at TV, or if you look at radio. And what, you, what a lot of people don't realize is that this trend follows a very Norm, uh, very, very highly expected cycle. It first starts with the, with the technology. So the printing press is the first part. Then the content, people start to write books and put them on the, on the printing press. Then the users that read those books. And then print goes into advertising, right? Uh, take newspapers, you, know, you need to have, uh, you know, you need, we needed to have the technology of the printing press to enable uh, uh, newspapers, but then you had the authors, and then you had the distribution, uh, readership, and then when you have the readership, you start to go into advertising. It happened on every medium, and I think the most important bit that a lot of people forget is that none of those mediums have gone away, because a lot of people accuse the internet of taking away those businesses, I actually think what has happened is that when there was only print, people advertised only in print, when radio came, they added radio to the mix on top of print because radio does things that are different than print and TV does things that are different. And the internet comes today to become uh, an, an interesting part of the blend that does things differently and accordingly, uh, uh, you know, it will fit into that part of the media mix if you want. Um, let's take um, a brand leader like Coca-Cola and just follow them uh, quickly through that life cycle. And uh, I'll ask you to try and notice how their evolution uh, from print to TV has gone through the years. So down there you see, uh, you know, their first print ads before color printing, you know, something that says, um, I don't remember exactly, but it was a very funny ad. You know, drink Coca-Cola, it will make you feel healthier or better or something like that, okay? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the, the big picture of it. Uh, it's quite nice. And then the second ad on the, on the right is uh, now in color. So you have the red logo, you have a, uh, you know, a bottle of Coca-Cola branding, you know, and, and in that ad it said, uh, you know, continuous quality, uh, uh, you know, is a, is a quality that you trust. So what they were advertising then, uh, it was basically something around, you know, you can trust our quality, no branding, no, no, none of that. And when TV started to go into the, um, uh, into the advertising phase, 1951, this was the first Coke ad. size coke yeah so so uh, a few things to notice it was really all about the dance and the fun and then the quality and the quantity you know it's like a big bottle you can drink a lot you could notice that they were not paying by the second because honestly this is like two ads put together right it's like it could have ended after the first king size coke and it continued when the 70s came you know uh, uh, color TVs were all over the place and uh, there was all that tranquility uh, you know peace uh, you know, side to life. So Coca-Cola came with this one. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs>
it's the real thing. I don't know if that's the world I would like to live in, uh, rather than the one I'm traveling through. Um, yeah, but uh, would, you, would you buy a Coke today if you got any of those two ads? Raise your hand if you're brave enough. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we have a... Right. Uh, so um, let's talk after that. Um, now, the, the, other thing, the other thing is, uh, you notice, again, they move to, to, to the sign of the times. This is the latest Super Bowl ad from Coke, 2009. I'm sorry, it's cut from the top. Strangers no more, so very much fit in the sign of the times again, you know, they're trying to say, hey, you know, this world is a little odd, it's, a, you know, a lot of digital people far away, you know, the, the ad is in uh, very, very uh, high quality graphics, high definition, and so on and so forth. So, so I think that the question I'm trying to get your minds to think about is that a lot of advertisers, especially the brand leaders of the world, continue to evolve as the times evolved. And I really will, uh, I'll show you in a, in a minute uh, how Coke started to go into the digital age as well. But I think the question I try to ask you is that sometimes people will say, hey, you know what, I know what I'm doing, I've done it for years, it's been working for years. The, qu the, 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 the warning message, unfortunately, is that it might not work anymore. Uh, and I think a lot of people need to start thinking about that. So before we go into what Coke started to do in the digital age, I'll ask you to think about two things. One is that um, there are lots of other curves happening. There is mobile advertising, social advertising, search and display are just entering into the uh, real, uh, uh, you know, um, hockey stick part of the curve and uh, and you know there will be very uh, t quite a few new media types that will each serve a different purpose right so mobile is really location based it serves in a different way social is really community and crowd based and so on so i, I think uh, as i speak about some of what the advertisers around the world are doing i'll ask you to notice that and how they blend all of that in the mix but let's go and and talk about um uh, what is it? Um, again, sorry that the top of the screen is not appearing. I'll read them for you. So four, four main things that I think are happening with the web that are different than all other media forms. One is that concept of global coverage, individual targeting. So for the first time ever, you can run an ad everywhere in the world at the same time, but target you. That one person. I'm looking for this one person out of the whole globe, and I can do that on the internet. I'll show you examples of that. Uh, Data-driven and not hype, I think, is the key. So I've, I've worked in many industries before Google, and I thought I was analytical and mathematical, and I am nothing compared to the Googlers. I mean, seriously, this company is totally, totally driven by numbers and algorithms. And, you know, we really think a lot about data. And, and this is the nature of the world we live in. The internet is totally driven by data. Uh, blended across media formats is the, is the concept I'm telling you about as new S-curves start to emerge and how people are uh, getting every media type to use uh, in, the, in a way that they... Uh, that they can use best. And then there are new forms of uh, creativity and most importantly, engagement. Let's go through those one by one. So that concept of global coverage, I'm gonna give you two examples, one from BT and one, uh, sorry, um, BA, and one from uh, Coca-Cola. So uh, I just ran a quick search, Dubai to London, before I, uh, before I, um, I, I went on the flight, just to, to show this to you. The organic search results will normally, depending on where you are in the world, sometimes they will show, the, you know, they will show BA on top, and sometimes they won't. Right? Uh, if you were in the UK and you searched for London to Dubai, BA would probably be the top organic result. But if you're in Dubai and searching for Dubai to London, it's not. And as you can see here, there is a Gulf Air ad. I'm sorry, you can't see. <laughs> but anyway, there is a Gulf Air ad. There are a couple of ads here that are not BA. And accordingly, BA decides to say, if there is a person 
today that is looking for a flight from Dubai to London, and I have seats on my flights, and I know he's looking for me, I know he speaks English, I know he sits in Dubai, then I might as well grab that opportunity. It's action-based. If he clicks on me, then I've made a booking, or at least I made a reference to my, uh, to my um, uh, business, right? Now, uh, in the airline industry, we know that less than 9% um, of people who will go and search for a flight will go and search by a um, company name. So you wouldn't go and search for lot. I'm, sh I'm sure you wouldn't. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and accordingly, to be there when people need you or when people are looking for you is something that is very important. I'll show you in a bit what BA is doing to blend that with other uh, advertising methods. But this is something that Coke is doing in Pakistan. That, nothing, uh, I, I wish if I could play the whole song, I actually liked it quite a lot when I downloaded it. This is uh, uh, their approach to talent in, uh, in Pakistan. They're trying to blend top talent, top um, you know, singers that are very well known and just uh, you know, nobodies. And they have uh, quite a few artists in there that are uh, not only belonging to a brand that is really strengthening the brand, but you, could, you should look at the interaction from the crowd, you know, commenting on the songs, sending them to each other. This is almost free advertising by having a channel on YouTube. I'll show you one from Poland later. Uh, by having a channel on YouTube that is globally targeted, you know, looking for talent is something that every brand in the world is doing now, but totally, totally local when it comes to the country of Pakistan. Um, so, so that idea of global targeting and um, global um, uh, coverage, uh, individual targeting is very big. But I think the biggest sign of the internet is that concept of being data driven. Any of you uses insights for search? Okay, if any Googler is not raising their hand, we're going, we have a trouble. Yeah, so, uh, so insights for search is, is really a gold mine. I mean, if you're all in marketing and in agencies, you, could, you can think about the times where you've always begged your manager for that $100,000 to do a research. It's like, I really need to know if they prefer a red pack or a white pack, right? You know, and we've all done that, and we've all gone with that uh, 100 user sample, and we've done our campaigns, and we ended up with, uh, you know, some trend of some sort. The internet is doing that for you on m minute by minute for billions of people. There are billions of people that are telling us that they are more interested, I can't read this one, that they are less interested in business schools today than they were uh, in, uh, a year ago maybe um, um, something that has a result with the recession, it shows you exactly which countries in the world this is happening in, and you can chase that trend to the uh, uh, you know, uh, individual um, uh, lo local uh, place, if you want. Uh, you, know, you, 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 you do that on YouTube, so for YouTube, you can take any specific video and, and understand exactly how many times and where it's being viewed and so on and so forth. It gives, me, gives you a distribution, it gives you what uh, sort of uh, uh, of you know um, category this belongs to, and accordingly you can target your advertising exactly to people who want to see fish tanks in California, right? It's it's as powerful as that. Uh, the other thing that I'm really a fan of is Google Trends. Uh, so Google Trends basically allows you to um, compare multiple trends together and understand how uh, those trends are, um, are really shaping uh, the favor, you know, what is in favor and what is going out of favor. I always show a slide, I didn't show it today, about uh, the, the car crisis, you know, the GM and Ford and so on, the, the difficulties they faced in the last few years. And I could show you a chart. It's so eye-opening, you know, how people have moved from searching for luxury or engine power in the you know, early 2000s, where they were buying those Hummers and big, up, big pickup trucks and sports cars, to going uh, to searching more for uh, fuel efficiency after Al Gore's uh, global warming uh, warning, you know, and then searching for hybrid, and then searching for uh, you know, uh, used cars or cheap four-door sedans in the economic crisis. And these are some very, very clear signals that an industry should pick on and decide to change their, their, uh, 
their um, you know, portfolio based on that. Uh, these things are very real. Uh, when the swine flu uh, outbreak started to, not outbreak, but uh, threat, uh, started to, uh, to threaten the world, one of the most reliable sources of information was Google. We actually had uh, a lot of the World Health Orga organizations talking to us about when people start to search more for flu in a certain part of the world, we could pinpoint to very high accuracy uh, that fl the flu trends, how many cases and so on, because basically now when people get the flu, they go and search. I think the Euro Euro Eurovision, uh, how many agree with the winner, by the way? Uh, okay, I would have chosen a different... Uh, is this recorded? Uh, I agree with the winner. Okay, uh, so, no, I think the cello girls were really the best ones. Uh, so, so uh, as a matter of fact, we, we tracked uh, through search to an accuracy of 1%, the public voting. We, had, we made an, a, a difference of 1% between the actual public voting through SMSs and, uh, and what people um, um, you know, were actually going to choose. This sort of information, guys, is not something you should take uh, uh, easily. I mean, uh, just going back to, to the, uh, using information to show you the next point, which is really all about blending multiple media formats. Um, this is a chart that we did with um, Pontiac in the US, uh, where basically they traced, uh, they, they followed the uh, impact of when they show an ad on TV, what happens on search. Right? So after they show an ad on TV, on hourly basis, you could see every time an ad showed on TV, the orange uh, curve below, a peak in search almost instantly uh, as a result, uh, and which is the blue chart. Okay? Which is quite interesting when you think about it, because uh, for, for Pontiac specifically in that case, people, as usual, did not go and search for Pontiac model type, but they went and searched for sports car or, you know, uh, uh, four-seat sedan or whatever, and guess who showed up? Honda. Right? So basically, they were advertising on, uh, in, on TV, and people were ending up getting more information about Honda. By nature, people today don't believe what they get told in the traditional media. They go and check themselves. More than 43% uh, of people in Europe will do that. So if you tell them a message on TV that this is the best car on earth, they'll go and search for it, but they'll also go and search for comparable uh, cars to make up their mind. So basically, blending uh, is a behavior that we started to see more and more from the top advertisers, where they understand what TV is good for and from, from brand building, but catching the searcher is something that they do. So they take all the traditional media and they take all the new uh, digital media and they blend it together in a funnel where it's totally well integrated. And it's definitely something that as agencies or as customers, you need to really, really master because this is, um, if, if you're not in that place today, it's like being in the 70s and focusing totally on newspaper advertising. Okay, so if, if you know, think of that or being in the 90s and focusing totally on radio, you can't go to your client in, in the 90s and tell him the best way to advertise is radio only. Um, so, so here is an example of blending here from Poland. So the gentleman in the room will have to go watch that uh, ad without me. Uh, I cannot play it anymore. Now, uh, now the, 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 the thing is, so Axe basically takes something that is very, very catchy on TV and they give it to the digital world so that there is access to it. Uh, this is the BA. When I told you about the BA advertising, one of the most, um, um, I think, ingenious uh, ads I have seen on the web was this, which blended uh, the TV campaign, which is what I'm going to show you, with search and geo, because the, you know, uh, uh, travel is a very geo-based product.
So, so that blending actually had a, a significant impact. I could share some numbers, at not, not the confidential ones with you. But they caught people from TV to go and to, to search on Geo to be able to find the location they're going for, you know, plan their trips on Earth, Google Earth or whatever. And then when people search for those tickets, and that whole mix was really fantastic. Let me just talk about creativity. How many of you have seen this video on YouTube? Coke and Mentos? Okay. So the first reaction to, to, to this uh, video on YouTube from Coke was, hey, Coke is a very important brand. It's one of the world's top brands. And you know, you shouldn't play around with it this way. It's a very healthy drink, and you should be enjoying it, and so on and so forth. And of course, the community went back almost in riots. They said, we enjoyed it very much. We actually bought Cokes and Mentos and tried this at home. You know, It's something that we really loved. And, and honestly, it was quite eye-opening, because then Coke came back with this Coke show on, it was a, couple, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think, where basically they went back and said, OK, you know what? If you like that idea, just go ahead and do anything you want with Coke and put it on YouTube. Let's show it to the world which is, I think, a very interesting flexibility from a brand owner, which is normally very hugging and protective, to say, hey, if that's the sign of the times, then maybe we should go ahead and do that. Uh, so so I'll, I'll say that you know, if, you, if people are not focused on using the web for business today, I think they're missing out on quite a lot. right? And it's really a very significant um, a very significant wave that people need to look into. I have one more section, which means I will be five minutes over time. OK? Yes? Should I go ahead? No? Raise your hand if you're happy with that. Good. All right. Thank you. They're awake. Great. So let's talk about some trends. And um, I'll, um, I'll just, uh, again, it's all about data, right? This is what we do in Google. It's all about data all the time. These are actual charts of technology adoption cycles of every technology uh, that, um, that uh, you know, uh, based on US figures over the years from 1900 until today. The stove, by the way, is considered a, um, you know, a, uh, a technology, right? I'll, I'll ask you to think about, um, you know, the technology adoption cycle of electricity, right? And I'll ask you to think about what we have today. So today, every ho household in America has electricity. And uh, you know, think if you were in the year 1900. So the light bulb was inv invented back in 1879. Uh, OK, uh, it took Edison time to form GE and start laying cables and so on. And then uh, he started his company and started to have uh, you know, cables laid down. The electric fan was a huge hit. Uh, this is the first electric fan. By the way, the inspiration of the GE logo came from that look. And, uh, and that was only in 1902. Uh, in 1905 was the first vacuum cleaner that was a 45 kilogram machine that needed two people to operate. And uh, uh, the toaster was the absolute killer app. Uh, so it came only in 1912 to, to the Americans, right? Uh, I will ask you, honestly, to think of yourself back in 1905. Humans have an, a tendency to say, that's it. Everything that ever needs to be invented has been invented, right? Everything, you know, we have light bulbs, cables at home, and electric fans. Come on, you know, what else can happen? Now, I love this quote, uh, Mr. Winston Churchill. This is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. Now, if you see what I see inside Google and our engineering labs, you would not believe this more. I mean, it is mind you know, uh, boggling what we're doing in Google and what others are doing on the internet. It's not, the internet is going to be driven more by the crowds than by, hopefully, we're not a big player, but the, by the big players, right? Uh, it is the beginning of the end. And I will tell you, just like you watched the 1951 Coke ad and you said, oh, <laughs> that's funny, right? Your kids are going to watch what we've done today on the, on the web and say, oh my god, these guys were weird, 
right? So, so let me give you a few examples. Again, four areas just to, 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 to try. I couldn't, I had eight trends I wanted to talk to you about. I just had to put down four, but we can talk about others over coffee. So the content explosion uh, is going to be a huge, huge wave. I need you to understand this. There was a time when if you wanted to become Madonna, you had to go to a talent agency, go to a producer, then have the rights and the distribution and go through Virgin Megastore and all of that nice stuff. That is going to be no more. Right? The talent is coming from absolutely everywhere. There are, you know, the, the evolution of dance, the video I showed you, 170 million times. There is nothing more popular than that. And there are ways and means that are being invented as we speak for people to monetize and make a living out of this. A lot of the big bands are actually starting to go that direction. Nine Inch Nails, for example, one of my son's favorites, uh, are, are actually, um, you know, they've recently had an album that they um, released online for free and only sold a, um, a limited edition uh, CD with a, with a box pack for $75, made more than $1.7 million out of that. Not bad for not going through the whole cycle. So this is a trend that, uh, that is definitely huge. I really think if any of you has any talent whatsoever and you're expecting uh, you know, the agencies uh, to help you out, not the agencies, you know, the talent agencies or the producers to help you out, I would definitely encourage you to go on the web and show your talent. There has been some great success stories. Uh, the other one that I think is important is the true human interface. It's, it's an area that truly intrigued me all my life. I started in IBM, I worked in Microsoft, and recently uh, for the last three years in Google. And th this whole concept of human interface is something that really annoyed me all my life because we have always been taught to think how the computer thinks. We were told the way to do it is through a keyboard or a mouse because the computer couldn't understand what we were telling it. We were taught to do what it should do. Now that was a fair comment when, uh, uh, you know, a fair approach when computing power could not allow allow computers to behave like humans. This is going away. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to show you here things that are actually happening. So this is uh, the Pizza Hut ordering uh, on the iPhone. Can we take the volume up a little, please? Mm, fantastic. Next, pick a size. You can pinch it to make it smaller. Or stretch it to make it bigger. Now you're ready for toppings. Just scroll through and drag them to your pizza. How about pepperoni? And mushrooms. Only want pepperoni on half? Just tap it and tilt it. Your pizza is ready to go. Okay, so, so the concept is very important, guys. Um, what's happening here is that so finally we are at a stage where human interface is going to become the way to go. And I think you're going to see a lot of innovations as we go forward uh, that help us do this. Um, you know, touch is one of them, handwriting is another, speech is a third. But definitely I shouldn't expect in the future to be able to buy a computer and then learn a way to, uh, to deal with it. Right? Uh, the other um, uh, area that I th I'm, I'm personally hugely passionate about is that whole uh, machine, uh, language, ma machine language translation. Uh, how many of you have ever used translate.google.com? Yeah. Um, keep your hands up if you think it's good enough. Actually, thank you. The, your, the ones that kept their hands up are the nice people. Uh, <laughs> So it, it is, it's actually not that bad, but it's not great for sure, right? So machine translation is a problem that humans have worked at for a very long time. The problem is that machine translation does not allow us to, if you teach the machine the grammar, this is not how we humans think. Right? So, uh, so, so unfortunately, when I'm talking to you now, I'm not really looking at what is an adjective and what is a, you know, a verb, and I don't do that in my mind anymore. And accordingly, my language will have errors in it that are built in, but are the way we speak, right? And for a very long time, we tried to teach computers the exact grammar of how to do things, and the sentence structure has always been very complex. Now, recently, Google came up with a project that I am championing for the Arabic language, which I think is a fantastic project 
project called G-Trans. And G-Trans is a machine translation tool that actually allows you to translate something from English to Arabic, but then look at it. And if you don't like anything, you just highlight it and say, I don't like this. I think it should be translated that way. With page rank and technologies that are machine learning, machine interfaces, uh, the machine is now tr starting to learn. I don't know why they translate the Great Pyramid of Khufu this way, but everybody says it should be this way. So I'm going to agree with that, and in the future, I'm going to translate it that way. So contextual behavior based on human activity is going to be the way forward. And I can guarantee you that very soon, we will start to see machine translation that is almost as good as humans. Now, imagine that. Uh, when I send an email to you in, in English in the future, you will read it in Polish, and you can respond in Polish, and I read it in English. This world, I think, is going to be a much, a much nicer world than the one we're sitting in. Um, and then the final one is the uh, fusion between reality and the web. So um, we still had two worlds until today. And one big thing, I think you saw Street View and Google Earth, and that were the, these were the very first attempts of fu fusion between them. This is a technology that I'm very impressed with. So, you know, blending the reality and, and, the, and, and the web is going to become very, very strong in the future. From two sides, one is this whole cloud computing approach to life. So everything is going to happen in the cloud and everything you can do, you will do in the cloud. And the other is how you can take the real world and put it on the, on the, on the, you know, on, on the web and vice versa. So think of this as a way to search for locations. What is this building? You know, is there anything that I can buy in this neighborhood? Where is the nearest doctor? And so on and so forth. This is, by the way, a production uh, um, application. It's not something that is new. It's released only in uh, Amsterdam as we speak. So with that, I uh, will uh, leave you with one question. If that's what's happening on the web, are you running free and having a lot of fun and enjoying every part of it, or are you sometimes stuck in the old part of the world? And with that, I thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I ran five minutes over time. Thank you for that. And I hope you have a great day. So uh, enjoy and ask a lot of questions and give us a hard time. Thanks.